nine-year-old twin daughters and a lifelong learner, I believe I am. I'm very excited to hear this next speaker, Professor Duke. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, Larry, as everyone has done, I need to publicly thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, Larry and I have never met until yesterday, so he hired me on spec. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be here and be a part of this conference. I don't think I've ever been at a conference that had a more eclectic uh, group of speakers, and I'm happy to be here. I have to tell you, when I, when I first started giving talks for scientific meetings, uh, being somebody who lives in a music school, uh, I was reminded of the 1992 vice presidential debates. I don't know if you remember, some of you are old enough to remember that. Uh, and, and the candidates at that time uh, were Senator Al Gore and then Vice President Dan Quayle, and an unknown person, uh, a, a very, very revered uh, retired mil military man uh, named James Stockdale. Uh, and it, when it was time for Stockdale to introduce himself and was given the floor, uh, he looked into the camera and said, who am I and why am I here? Uh, which was an inauspicious beginning to a very brief political career, as many of you know. Um, although, after having watched the speakers I've seen so far, I, I, I think I do know why I'm here. And uh, I, I think Larry is either very lucky in picking speakers or ingenious. And uh, so I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and think he's the latter of the two. Um, I, I, whenever I hear meetings like this, I try to connect a theme among the people who are participating. And one theme that is very prevalent to me through all of this is the recognition of differences among individuals and recognizing and accommodating and even celebrating those differences. Uh, when I'm talking about learning, it's impossible to talk about learning without talking about school, and school doesn't do that very well. Uh, school generally treats people as if they're all alike, and if anything has been learned from all the talks that have happened so far today, it's that uh, no policy decision should be based on mean values, uh, because the mean values represent almost no one in the population. And, and, and one of the things that I'd like to address with you today is thinking about how to devise learning experiences in ways that recognize individual differences and all of the differences that people bring to the table when they come into a room. And I'll talk about that more as we go along. But being a music guy, uh, I'm going to start by playing a little music. And the, the, the tape that I'm going to show you uh, was part of a series that was broadcast on HBO a couple of years ago called The Music in Me. And the producer of this series ingeniously uh, put out this call for children around the United States to send in videotapes of themselves making music and got literally hundreds of videotapes uh, that were you know, amateur tapes of some girl sitting on her bed in Hawaii playing a ukulele and some other kid in an apartment in New York City playing blues guitar and some kid in Ohio beating the hell out of a drum set in his bedroom. It was just stunning. But what permeated all of those videotapes was the utter joyfulness in the music making of all those children. Uh, and interposed among all those amateur videos were a couple of really highly produced videos of very prodigious children making music. And I'm not going to say anything else except to show you one of those videos now, and I'll talk about it after it's over. <laughs> the true meaning. Oh, here's the swan, something's happening. It's about a swan traveling through the water. It's really graceful. And then you look closely. really happening now. Some parts 
the swan doing something not so sad like gliding through the water and then all of a sudden it's starting to cry he struggles to get on the shore oh no he's starting to really die now It's just one of those false alarms, and then it starts to hit you. People say that I express the music really well, and everybody thinks that's the best part of me. Now, if you're not touched by that, you have no soul. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Uh, Nathan, who was 11 when that was recorded, is now 17. Uh, he's about to uh, enter a joint program at Juilliard in Columbia uh, this uh, fall. Uh, he's quite a remarkable young cellist, and musician who wants an academic and intellectual life as well. It's really quite a remarkable story. But the reason I show that video is that Nathan is very clear about what music is for. Right? The whole point of music is to express ideas, emotions, moods to other human beings. That's the point. Now, there's a lot of ha that, that, that happens in learning music in which that idea which many people who understand music very deeply understand is the central idea of music, is nowhere in the room. We're getting people ready to be ready to prepare to start to eventually begin to express something to another human being. But of course, many people who start music, and I would wager that many of you in this room, at one point in your lives, took music lessons and then stopped. Right? And I would argue that many of the reasons that many of you stopped was not because you're incapable of doing whatever it is the teacher was trying to get you to do. It's that you engaged in music making because you had this idea about what you wanted to do, what, it, what the point of it was, how music spoke to you, and that just wasn't present in your own experience as a music maker. Now, this may seem like it's just a music thing. It's not a music thing. This is a school thing. This is a learning thing. And everyone in this room understands that if you are in any profession in which you interact with other human beings, you have the intention at many times to teach other people things about what you know. Now, when I think about how we learn and how we don't, uh, I, by, by learning, I don't mean just remembering things that you're shown or remembering things that you're told. I, I have a very specific de definition for learning, and I define it as a change in one's functional capacity. You change the functional capacity of the learner. So knowing stuff really doesn't get you much. And a lot of educational experiences, so-called, are about what I'm doing right now, conveying information to other people by talking to you and showing you things. And I have to tell you, this is a terrible learning environment. And truth in advertising, at the end of my 45 minutes, none of you will have learned anything in this room. Uh, but it's not because of any incapacity on your part. It's because you're not busy enough to be learning anything. Uh, you know, if you think about what happens when we learn, our, our brains physically change in some way. Now, what would motivate a brain to expend the energy to actually reorganize itself? Well, certainly not most of what you're doing right now. Even if you're paying attention, even if you're enjoying what you're paying attention to, even if you're into it. Now, when the learning will start is when you leave this room and you start to recall what happened in here and you try to apply that in some meaningful way to something that's happening outside of that room. And that's when the learning will begin. And I'd like to focus on the features of that process in just the couple, next couple of minutes. Um, this is my favorite phrase that I've ever composed. And I think any idea having to do with teaching somebody else about anything, whether you're trying to teach a study section about your grant, or you're trying to teach a listening audience about your ideas, or you're trying to teach a child about something that you think is important for the child to learn, should start with a vision of students as accomplished learners. And what I mean by that is, when all the instruction is over, when all the activities of learning are done, what do you want this person or these people to be like? Now, I choose my verbs very carefully. I don't mean what you want them to know or be able to do, but what do you want them to be like? Because one of the things that I say in my little brief précis about my talk 
is that learning, real learning, meaningful learning, involves not only knowledge and not only skill development, but the development of attitudes as well. I mean, all of you who are successful in this room, which I assume is everybody in this room, are successful not only because you know a lot of stuff, and not only because you can do a lot of stuff, but you have successful, productive attitudes about the stuff that you know and can do. Right? If you want to be a bench scientist, and every time an experiment doesn't work, you want to throw something across the room, you're not going to be a very successful bench scientist, because most experiments don't work. Right? And all of you who have been successful in this room, myself included, have life experiences that are full of failures. Uh, and, and we would not know what we know if we ourselves did not experience many of the failures that we experience. And what I'd like to talk about tonight, <clears throat> and it is almost tonight, uh, is how school experiences, how many learning experiences, how many experiences with doctors, with patients, and healthcare providers, with clients, don't leave room for that error making on the part of learners. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, I, I wrote a list of adjectives that, that describe my favorite student. I, I would love rooms full of this person. But I reject out of hand that people come from the factory like that, right? Students in school learn to be attentive, or they don't. And they learn to be meticulous about their work, or they don't. And whether any of those characteristics presents themselves has everything to do with the environment in which learners find themselves at a given period of time. Because if you, if you follow students around a school, whether it's a primary school, a secondary school, a college, you will see the very same students behaving very differently depending on whose classroom they're in. I mean, some undergraduates go to class actually having read the material before the lecture. Imagine. Uh, other students come, 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 to, come to class. It's the fifth week of the semester. I probably should get around to buying the book. They go to class. They bring the student paper. They've got some crosswords. It's the same student, right? So it's not just in, an inherent thing to the individual. Right? The environment has a great deal to do with how the, the individual is going to behave. Many people who I work with, who work with children who seem absolutely unmotivated in school, when you follow them home, will go to their Xbox, the, the, their Xbox, their PlayStation, and sit there till their thumbs bleed. Now, how can somebody say that's an unmotivated kid? It's a highly motivated kid. But there are some characteristics that define the sources of their motivation. And, and again, I, I'll talk about that as we go along today. So my, my argument here is that any learning experience, regardless of what learning experience happens to be, has to start with a clear, crystalline, vivid image of learners as accomplished learners, when everything is done and has gone the way we'd like it to go. Um, I'm going to play a little video now. It's a little shorter clip. It's about 15 seconds long. <clears throat> Every large university like Colorado, like Texas, who plays Division I sports, has little self-promoting 15-second spots that tout how cool the institution is uh, that are played during uh, basketball, football, baseball events. And I'm going to play you one that Texas doesn't play any, 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 anymore, but they played it for a couple of years. It was, it was my favorite one because it just expresses so well the audacity of Texas, uh, which I love about being in Texas. I, I'm not from Texas, you might guess from my voice. I'm from New Jersey. But, uh, and if you told me 27 years ago I'd spend the next 26 years of my life in Texas, I would have said you're out of your mind. But anyway, I've grown to love the place. And, and I want you to watch this little video, and we'll talk about it after it's over. We don't claim to be able to change the world. We just change people. And then they change the world. We're Texas. Now, come on. Who do I who doesn't want to go to school there, right? I mean, we got Walter Cronkite, steel guitar, you have breakfast tacos. I mean, this is the coolest place. Now, like I said, I love the audacity of that. You know, we just change people. We just change them. You know, they come here, we change them. And of course, whenever I, when this was playing, whenever I find myself at some social gathering with upper level administrators in the institution, I would say, you know that ad, you know, they said we change people? How, how do we know that? And, and how do we know we change them in the way we're intending to change them? And the answer is, we don't have any idea, right? I know we do a lot of stuff to them. You know, we bring them to rooms like this and we talk to them and make them write papers and go to labs and do things. But we have no idea the extent to which we're changing them and if we're changing them in a direction that we intend to be changing them. Right? Now, this whole idea about having a vision of students as accomplished learners creates a different kind of thinking. It says that I have a really clear idea about what you're going to be like when I'm finished with you. And when you leave this experience, 
whether it's my class this semester, or whether it's my degree program, or whether it's my elementary music series, or whatever it happens to be, this is what I envision your being like. Now, that, that's a difficult thing to do, because often, when most of the time, when we think about planning anything, we think about planning things from the front end to the back end, right? which makes sense. I mean, when we were little kids, we learned how to tell a story, you know, what happened first, what happened second, and the frog came, and then we kind of go through that little series like that. It makes perfect sense. But when you plan learning like that, when you plan learning experiences and curricula like that, the big variable that is absent in one's thinking is time. Right? We don't have time to do all that stuff. I mean, it would be nice if we did this first, and then we did this second, and then we did this third, and then this 15th, and then this 64th, except, oh, semester's over. Right? And we didn't get to it. Well, well now what? Well, I, good luck. You know, read faster. Finish the end. Somebody was telling me, I don't know who was last night at the little get, get, get gathering, and said there was a professor it might have been you, Beth, who was telling me the professor toward the end, of the end of the semester and suddenly realized that, you know, there were, I don't know how many minutes left in his lecture and he had like 40 slides left and said, you know, look at him on the way home and you kind of flew through the thing. My own experience, I was an undergraduate, I had a professor for music history, we had a sort of a history of Western music in one year over three quarters and uh, from, you know, the Greeks all the way through contemporary times. And uh, I remember the look on my professor's face when he looked at his notebook and saw that he had two lectures bat left and we were just getting to Debussy, you know, and uh, we were supposed to go through, you know, 1968 or something. So, so we did all of Impressionism that day, you know, a little bit of primitivism the next day. On the way out of class, he held up a picture of Louis Armstrong, that was jazz, you know. We gotta get through this stuff, you know. And, and by God, he covered all that material. Uh, he did his duty. Except, of course, none of us internalized any of that because we just blew through it. And, you know, he covered it, he met his responsibilities, except it never became a part of our thinking because we didn't have enough time to practice thinking about the things that he was having us think about. Um, so I, I only have two ideas today. Um, and the first one is, when you're trying to teach somebody something, you're a learner too. And your job as a learner is to figure out what's going on in that person's head who's listening to me. Now, there's, a, there's an obvious upshot to that. If, if that's my goal, I have to stop talking every once in a while and listen. Now, it might not be listening to every single person talk every single day. I mean, I sometimes teach in a classroom that looks just like this with a crowd that looks just like this. So what I have students do every day is every day students write in class. And sometimes they write for three minutes or five minutes to some prompt that I give them. And I read all of those. It doesn't take long. I don't grade them. I just read them to find out what's going on in people's heads. Because if I don't know what's going on in the heads of the people who I'm talking to, then how can I possibly adjust what I'm doing in a way to accommodate all the individualities that inevitably exist in that room, right? Because you're not all the same. And all of you in this room right now are experiencing right now differently than everyone else in the room because you brought different things to the table. And when you walk out of this room today, depending on what happens to you after this, you will remember this differently than the person sitting next to you. So memory is a very dynamic thing, which I'll say a little bit more about in just a couple of minutes. So you're a learner too, that's the first idea. And, and the second thing is, your goal as a teacher, and I'm saying teacher, grant writer, caregiver, whatever, right, is not to change the behavior of the people you're working with. It's to change people you're working with perceptions of their own behavior which is a sometimes subtle but really important consequential difference. Right? I mean, one of the things that we often do, especially when we're teaching physical skills to children and adults, is that we just change the way they're moving to change the physical skills. But the problem is they're not changing their physical skills. We're changing their physical skills. And I'll give you one example that makes the point, using another music example. I had a student who was teaching a young kid to play the cello, and uh, when this kid would put his cello bow on his cello, he'd put the bow on the string and he'd move like this, and you can see I don't look very comfortable doing that, and that's not the way cellos should move, as you saw from Nathan there. So what my student would do, a kid put the bow on the cello before he played the first note, my student would move the cello bow to the right position, which is perpendicular to the string, and then the kid would play. Right? And they'd talk a little bit about what the kid just played. He says, start again. The kid would put his bow on the string, the teacher would move the bow to the correct place, and the kid would play. This went on for many minutes. Right? And we're watching this videotape together, and my student says to me, what is wrong with that kid? You know, I keep correcting his cello bow. It, he's, he's still, he's got his bow in the wrong place. See, he has never once put his bow in the right place. Right? Think of the chain of learning that's taking place. Put your bow in the wrong place, teacher corrects it, you play. Put your bow in the wrong place, teacher corrects it, you play. Why in the world would we expect every kid to start putting his bow in the right place? Right? Now, if you think about that for a minute, the idea of error correction is central to learning. And I don't mean error correction by a teacher correcting your error. I mean, you're muddling around and finding your own error and correcting it. 
Now, there's a downside to that, and that, that is that things move much slower when you give learners time to correct their own errors. And the thing working against that most of all is that it's really reinforcing to solve other people's problems. And all of us who became teachers, I love solving other people's problems. It makes me so happy. So I see a student who's really confused, and I think, God, let me come unconfuse you. And they're happy, and they're smiling at me, because now they're not confused anymore, so they think, right? And I'm happy because they're smiling at me, and now they're happy because they're in my learning environment, and they're happy. Except the problem is, I, I'm solving the problem. And even now, after all these years of teaching, I find myself having to resist my temptation, which is to always jump in and solve the problem. It, it takes a lot of time, and all of us who are parents understand this, right? Because what we want to do is make all of our children's decisions for them so they don't make any wrong decisions, except the problem is they're not making any decisions. And then when they go off and go to college, they go berserk because we've always been deciding for them and not teaching them to decide for themselves. So this, this, these two ideas will kind of run through what we're doing. I, I'm going to show a little, another little film clip. It's two minutes long. It's part of a study that was conducted in the 1990s. Uh, by some folks at Harvard and MIT in which they asked uh, people at the graduation ceremonies at Harvard and M I MIT to do some very basic operations with electricity. They asked some other questions too, but I'm gonna show you the, the, the options about electricity. And like I said, it's a two minute clip. I'm just gonna play it and let it play and then after it's over, we'll talk about it. Graduates of Harvard and MIT. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We are the premier engineering and science institution in the world. No shortage of self-confidence in MIT Europe. Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Yeah. Light a bulb with a battery and a wire. Maybe. Yes. All right. Definitely. Do you think you can light a bulb with a battery and a wire? Battery and wire? Oh, well, yes, why not? Okay. Definitely. Okay, can you do that? The interesting part about the batteries and bulbs question is that people always predict that they can do it. Students say, of course I can do this. Uh, any hints I should have here? Teachers say, of course my students can do this. Oh! Do you know why that didn't work? I have no idea. Battery could be dead, the bulb could be bad, I'm hooking it up totally incorrectly. I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. But if I had to guess, I would say it's operator error. Okay. I know it's possible, but I don't know how to do it. It's only after failing that you begin to get upset with the question and think, well, maybe it's a trick question, maybe this has something to do with manipulating the wires, they couldn't hold all the wires together. You don't have a current if you only have one wire. You need a complete a closed circuit. But that's not the case. Oh, uh, well, if I do it with a little light bulb, I just do this. <laughs> In which case, the, the light just lights up. It goes to the fundamental understanding of electricity. If one cannot light a light bulb with a battery and wire, then everything built upon those basic ideas has problems. I know, all my Stanford friends love this film. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I would tell you that they, they didn't look for the six dullest looking people on campus that they asked this question of. And in fact, this, what are, what's depicted in the, in the video is a small subset of a larger sample, and the proportion in the video that could answer the question was proportional to the number of the sample. So most people couldn't answer this question. And they didn't only ask questions like this, they asked questions like, why are there seasons on the, on the Earth? And people would say, well, because in the summer, you know, the Earth is tilted on its axis, everybody knows that, and they say, so the Earth's a little closer to the sun in the northern hemisphere. Well, of course, we're 93 million miles from the sun, the Earth, diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles, so when you do that, you're not that much closer. So, uh, so, and they would say, well, what's your degree? And they would say, I, I'm in astrophysics. And so, the, um, 
I, you know, I say this, you know, it's kind of fun to think about the humor in this, but I'll get to you guys in just a minute. Uh, <laughs> but, what's, but what's revealing about this is that I'm sure everyone in that film could calculate fluctuating voltages in a circuit to many significant digits with integral calculus. And you give them a battery and a flashlight bulb, and they, what, did we have this? When, when did we, when we do this? Now, the, 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 the thing that's important about this is what that reveals about the kind of understanding that somebody has, even after a very fine education. Because what happens in most educational experiences is, I'm going to teach you, as your teacher, to do very specific things in very specific ways. And then, as a test of whether you've learned from me, I'm going to ask you to do the specific things that I've taught you in the specific ways that I've taught you to do them. And lots of people can get very good at school, if you're good in school, to do that very thing. But the extent to which you're actually able to take that and use that in some way that you've never been explicitly taught, I would argue, is the true measure of learning, is the true measure of understanding. Now, there's a downside to that, right? Because all of us in this room who are teachers know that students are made uncomfortable by ambiguity, especially when it comes to their own evaluations. Right? So if I'm saying, well, I'm going to teach you this material in this class, and then I'm going to bring you in as a way of evaluating how well you understand this material, and I'm going to show you something you've never seen before, and I've never shown you how to do, and I'm going to see how well you're able to muster your resources and apply it in this way, is anxiety producing to learners. So what do we do about that? Well, there's an easy solution. It takes time, but it's easy, is that that has to happen all the time. I mean, right now, the thought is, when we're teaching somebody something new, what we want to do is teach them in a way that almost obviates error and misunderstanding. And I grew up as an undergraduate in a very behaviorally oriented program. And I got really good as a teacher, I mean really good, at almost entirely obviating errors in learners. I got le learners very early on to be correct and accurate and skillful right from the get-go. But what was missing from their experience is what they got from correcting their own errors. And as we kind of go along in the time I have left this afternoon, I'll, I'll make more about that. Um, we're all very fortunate to have this three pounds of goo in our heads. Um, this is a remarkable machine. You know, 100 billion neurons making 100 trillion connections. I mean, those numbers are just unimaginably large, right? But brains do a couple things really well. They, they form associations, and they recognize patterns in the environment. Now, the thing is, as I was saying earlier, up for, for, for a long time, the, the prevailing wisdom about memory in human beings and other animals well, was that memory sort of works like a tape recorder. You know, you wake up in the morning, record button goes on, you go through your day, you do stuff, stuff gets put on the tape, you go to sleep, stop button goes on, you wake up the next day, you remember 2 o'clock the day before, you rewind the tape to 2 o'clock, and there's 2 o'clock the day before. That's a terrible metaphor for memory for a number of reasons. One being that the, the tape in our heads isn't blank. There are no blank spaces in our brains. There's stuff in there already. And what our brains are trying to do when we experience something new is figure out how the new stuff is like the stuff that's already in there. Right? Now, that takes time, and that takes practice. And you know, you'd think that musicians, as musicians, we would understand practice better than most people do. Well, actually, musicians don't understand this either. But the idea of encountering new experiences and having opportunities to practice interacting with those experiences in a way that creates error and creates confusion, but not just willy-nilly. Uh, my, my, my favorite phrase that I made up this year is the idea of creating strategic confusion in learners. Right? Now, right now, you have to get people, in an attitudinal way, comfortable with the idea of being confused. Right? Because again, if you're a student in my class and you're confused, you're thinking, well, you must not be a very good teacher because I'm confused. And if you were a good teacher, you would unconfuse me. Right? And that's why this, the, the, the confusion that takes place has to be strategic, right? I have to create situations where the confusion is great enough, right, that it is somewhat unsettling, and yet not so discombobulating that you don't even know how to get started. Now, that takes some skill as a teacher to do that. Uh, it takes practice to do that as well. And we'll talk about, before I get done today, some of the ways to do that. Um, you know, when my students hear me give a talk, uh, in, in class, because I, I, I never use lecture notes, and, and they're, they're amazed at my memory. They're amazed that I can remember all the stuff that I can remember. And they say, Dr. Duke, I can't believe you talk about all this stuff. I couldn't possibly remember all that stuff. And when an undergraduate tells me that, I, I reply to them, you're right, you couldn't possibly remember all that stuff. But it has nothing to do with the inherent limitations of your memory store. The reason you can't remember all that stuff is that your memory is organized entirely differently than mine is. Right now, when you look at the discipline that you're studying, you see a morass of detail 
that is disconnected and disorganized. And you're thinking, well, what I need to do is start remembering all that stuff. And actually, a lot of education is predicated on that is the task, right? A lot of medical school edu edu education is remember a lot of stuff, you know? And then a couple years from now, when you're on rounds, you'll see somebody present with certain symptoms. You're going to pull out the stuff out of your memory and get it, except that's not the way memory works. And the retrievability of memory is in many ways established when memories are first encoded. So when you have opportunities to practice at the initial stages of experiencing an idea, so that you can actually practice using the idea in a way that reveals gaps in your understanding and allows time for you to correct errors in your thinking, you create a different kind of learner. And a learner that has ultimately a much greater capacity to remember things because their organizational structure in their memory is much more like that of an expert. Right? Rather than thinking we're going to put all, we're going to have a big data dump, put all that stuff in there, and then we'll figure out how to organize it later. Well, later, they're going to be another major. So, so okay. Um, I, I, I brought some data. Uh, I brought a typical uh, learning curve for an undergraduate at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, on the y-axis is amount learned, on the x-axis is time. Um, I'll just let this speak for itself. <clears throat> There's midterms, uh, and there's finals. Uh, now, th there's a lot wrong with that picture, uh, not the least of which is that when it's 2.30 in the morning and you're right here, and the test is at 9 o'clock, and you got three more chapters to read, and you think, God, how am I going to get through all this stuff? And, you know, and you're out of coffee, and there's a little no-dose chrome left in your bottle, and you turn to a page, and it says, for further interest, turn to Appendix D. You don't think, well, my, let me just take a minute and see, well, I don't have time for that. I got to get through this damn stuff by 9 o'clock. Now, that's one of the problems of it. The other problem is, I have no time to practice these ideas. I have no time to refine these ideas in my own thinking. And the goal of education, regardless of the framework of the educational experience, is to flatten out that curve. Right now, in most educational experiences, in formal edu educational experiences, assessment opportunities are high in magnitude and low in frequency. Right? They don't happen very often, and when they happen, they matter a ton. And that needs to change. Right? What has to happen is there have to be multiple opportunities to try things out in ways that none of, in a way that no individual opportunity is that costly. Right? I mean, for all of us who are working in higher edu education now and in the sciences, when we write a grant and it doesn't get funded, no one lowers our grade. Right? We, we, we write a better grant. Right? And we send an article in for publication, and some cretins on the editorial board don't recognize how astute it is and want us to change it. Well, we change it. And often, damn it, it makes it better. Right? Now, that doesn't happen very often in experiences for learners in school. And there's no reason that it shouldn't. But what inhibits that experience is that what we're doing in school typically is we're trying to blow through way too much material in way too little time. Uh, for the past, I don't know, decade and a half at Texas, I give the opening talk on teaching for the new faculty in, in, the, in the university. And at the end of that talk, or near the end of that talk, because I know many of these people are, have been teaching in another institution before they come to Texas, or they're responsible and they've already been working on their syllabi, I say, you look at the amount of information in your syllabi and take two-thirds of it and throw it out. Now, they're horrified by that idea because they're thinking, my God, but I'm teaching 301 biology and my department chair teaches 302. Right? So when students in my class don't get two-thirds of material and they get the 302, and my department chairman says, well, certainly you've covered this in the last semester. And they said, well, no, we've never seen this before. And it's me. You know, what's going to happen? Well, what I replied to the young assistant professor is, listen, no matter what you teach in 301, that's going to happen anyway. <laughs> so free yourself from the burden of thinking that you're going to cover all that, because I don't care if you spend two weeks on it. Somebody's going to get next semester. We've never seen this before. So forget it. You know? <laughs> Teach something enough that there's enough practice that it actually becomes a part of one's thinking. Everyone in this room who considers themselves an expert is an expert not because of how much you know, but of what you do with what you know. And the idea that we put all the no stuff in first, and then we'll start doing the do stuff with the stuff you know, is a bad strategy. And I would argue that all of you who went through an educational system like the one I'm describing, it's not very effective, including me, well, how did we turn out so great? Well, because individually, we did the things that the institution didn't do. We were oddly curious, right? We actually left a lecture 
and talk to some of our friends about some confusing point or some challenging idea. Except many students don't do that. And so we can say, well, they should. Yes, but they don't. But, but they should. Yes, but they don't. We, we could actually teach them to do that. Right? We could actually make that part of their experience, which is a very different way to think about learning. Okay, so I said I'd get to you. How am I doing on time here? Okay, good. I can do this. Uh, I'd like everyone here to solve for x in your head. Don't say anything out loud. Just solve that equation for x. <clears throat> okay, I'd like someone to raise your hand and, vo and, and, and uh, volunteer an answer, please. <laughs> okay, I, it, thank you. I, I've, I have to make, I have to make a teaching moment here. There are like, what, 150 people in here? And like three people raise their hand. You know, when do they teach that? Like in third grade or something? What, what's wrong with you? Now, I got to tell you, when I give that opening talk at Texas, I put this same slide up. There's about 120 PhDs in, the, in a room. And I say, someone raise your hand, volunteer and answer. Five guys raise their hand. They're all in the math department, right? And, and I ask the, the, the people who are there, why the hell aren't you raising your hand, right? And the answer is, for the very same reason that your students, your students don't raise their hand when you ask a question. Because what if I was wrong? What if I raised my hand and I said three-eighths? And then you said, well, actually, it, it's not three-eighths. You know, then what? Well, then, then nothing, right? But you know right now, as grown adults with jobs, right? If you raised your hand and I called on you and you said three-eighths, and I said, well, actually, it's not three-eighths, you know that that would be the defining event of this week. <laughs> You'd be lying in bed next Wednesday night staring at the ceiling going, God, why did I raise my hand at that level? Right? Now, I want to tell you, that is intensely perverse. And you didn't, you didn't come out of the womb that way. We taught you to think like that, right? And what we taught you is, when you're a learner, and when you're, especially when you're a learner in public, for God's sake, don't be wrong, right? Now, I got to tell you, you know, I work at a major research uni uni university like this one, right? I, the state of Texas pays me an exorbitant salary to be confused most of the time. Right? All of us who do research, we're confused most of the time because we're working on problems that are really hard and they're confusing. Right? Now, what I've learned is to see that confusion as a challenging, damn it, I gotta figure this thing out. Right? What many learners learn in school is confusion is a signal to escape. Right? I'm confused, get me out of here. Right? So something has to change in a way that makes the confusion less emotionally threatening. Right? Less of something that you want to escape and avoid. So someone said three halves, right? Did, did you, yeah, would you tell me your name? I'm sorry. Steve. So Steve says th three halves. Can you tell me how you got that? Yeah. But, 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 but how, did, how, did, how, did you, how did you actually make that work? Or you just do it all in your head? <laughs> no. But, and actually, it's not a trick question. And we have, a, have another way of doing that that you learned in school? Yeah, Sharon. Yeah, invert, multiply, right? In fact, when a lot of people do that, this is the universal symbol for that problem. You know, you see that problem. In, all right? And what you do is you take this term in the, in the equation, which is called the divisor, and you invert it, and you get 2 over 1, and you multiply across, and, and you get 6 over 4, and you say you get 1 and a half. Okay, and all the people who didn't raise their hand are saying, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, would, I would ask Sharon, and I would ask anybody who learned that methodology, I would say, well, wh why do you invert the divisor? And usually I get crickets when, when somebody, when I ask that question. Don't, don't forget what you're going to say. So, so I usually I get crickets when, 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 as a question. And all of you have done hundreds of problems like this in your time in school. And only the odd numbered answers were the back of the book. So you, you've at least done 50s of problems like this in your time in school. And yet, you really don't understand the basis of the operation that you're doing. But you do know how to get the right answer. Now, if the goal of an institution is to get rooms full of people to get the right answer, what you do is you teach an algorithmic strategy for getting from the problem start to the answer. And you have people do it over and over and over again with equations like that with different numbers in them. And you have people go invert and multiply and go like that. And you will get everyone seemingly understanding what's going on. But they're not understanding. They're only getting the right answer. And that differentiation between getting the right answer and understanding what you're doing is only revealed when you ask people to do things that you've not explicitly shown them how to do. Now, that takes some skill on the part of a teacher because people who experience that are unhappy with you initially, right? 
So you have to shape those experiences in a pretty structured and strategic way. But it's, it's, it's very possible and very doable. Um, that's just going to make you nervous. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to leave you with... Uh, was something from one of my favorite writers on education, Alfred North Whitehead, one of the great mathematical minds of Western history. Uh, he wrote with Bertrand Russell, as many of you know, probably the most important piece on mathematical thought since Newton. Um, at, uh, the the, the uh, Principia Mathematica. Uh, really just, a, just, a, just a, a brilliant guy, and also quite interested in education in Great Britain, and quite a curmudgeon, uh, who I enjoyed a great deal. And uh, he described the process of learning as a series of steps that people go through when they experience anything new. And the first of those steps he described as romance. Because when any of us encounter anything that's immediately attractive to us, we have a sort of a romantic view of this thing. And, and my definition of romance, not whiteheads, is unrealistically highly positive. Right? When we meet somebody the first time at a party, you know, we think, wow, you know, wow. You know, unrealistically highly positive. And it never occurs to us, you know, we go up and introduce ourselves and they have this thing they do with their hair and their voice is lovely and they have this laugh, you know. And of course, it doesn't occur to you, this person eats and they have bodily functions and they're going to get sick and you're going to be holding their hair and you just, you know. So, uh, and, and all of us who got into anything hard, if we probably knew how hard it was when we got into it, we never would have started, right? Now, what Whitehead came up with his next phase of this, he called precision aptly named, right? And this little open pipe is my major professor, Cliff Madsen, came up with this idea, which I like a lot, this big open romantic space, and it closed in this little tight, little narrow corridor there. And this is where people change their majors, this is where people change spouses, this is where people uh, get out of whatever it is that they're doing, because it's, now it's difficult and it's hard. But what Whitehead said, if you kind of punch through that idea, you get to a stage he called generalization, which is actually a little bit romantic again, because now you can actually do the thing that got you attracted to this in the first place. Now, what most people see when they enter educational experiences, whatever this, the, 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 this one happens to be, and pardon my internet uh, gimmick here, is, uh, is this. I would love to do science. You would? Well, we're going to torture you for a long time. And way out there in the distance, you're going to actually do something that resembles science. You know, I don't know what it's like on, on your campus, but, but at Texas and in many of the places I visit, I look at the lab experiences of freshmen in the sciences, and it's really quite bizarre. It's quite unlike science, actually. I look at a lot of science in public schools. I work part, as part of an NS, NSF grant with science education in public schools, and I see a lot of things that are going on in schools that are in a classroom that says science in the door, but it doesn't look much like science. Uh, it, it looks like something quite different, and I won't get into that uh, today. So one of the things I'd like to expunge from the education lexicon is, uh, is the word prerequisites. Uh, because most of us who are expert in a discipline imagine all that somebody has to know to even begin to start to have an inkling of what it is that we're doing. So we create this barrier to the cool stuff, right, called prerequisites. And when you enter a discipline and you study the prerequisites, what they prepare you for is the next level of prerequisites, <laughs> right? And this goes on through much of your education, right? I, 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 until you finally get to the, the, good, the good stuff. <laughs> and the good stuff, I'm arguing, is what all of us in this room get up and go to work to do every day. Now, the question you have to ask is, how much does it really take to get to the good stuff? And, and my quick, all too glib answer is, not nearly as much as we think. Right? So, rather than having those good stuff experiences delayed, after people do all these prerequisite experiences. My argument is, this is not unlike what many speakers have said today, right? Is that you, you, you get to the good stuff right away. And then with the prerequisites, I apologize for this gimmick, but I paid 40 bucks for this software, um, that, <clears throat> <laughs> that, uh, that that goes away, and now what that does to human memory is this. You have this core of ideas and all of us who understand any discipline really deeply know that every discipline is based on a very small number of very fundamental ideas. And those ideas form an organizational structure for the other stuff that we learn about the discipline. We know where to put the other stuff or possible places to put the other stuff. But if you don't have that, then you're looking at this wash of stuff coming over, over you that is quite overwhelming and quite disorganized. So really, what happens is that now sort of expands out 
And now we elaborate on this core of ideas that make up the fundamental structure of the discipline. So I've, I've sort of extended Whitehead's idea a little bit when you take this visual metaphor here. And you say, if we start with this little romantic idea, that rather than having this long, seemingly interminable precision stage that gets to a generalization way off into the very distant future, we have many opportunities to make generalizations and practice and make mistakes all the way through the learning experience. And what we do, and we structure things this way with time moving up the y-axis here, is we create greater and greater intolerance, greater and greater tolerance for difficulty and work and confusion. Because they start out pretty small and pretty brief. And then over time, the problems become bigger and more challenging and require more patience on our part and more tenacity and more diligence and more whatever, right? But it doesn't start out that way. Now, is this hard to do? It's really hard to do. I mean, the ideas are very appealing. The implementation of this, really hard. Because what it requires us to give up is the idea that learning is about content. Because learning isn't about content. Learning is about skills. And you do have to have content because you have to have something to use your skills with, right? But you don't have to have all the content before you start applying the skills. Now, that's the fundamental shift in thinking that's necessary to make this work. And as you could tell, I could go on for many hours about this, but I think my time is up, so I'm going to stop. So thank you all for your attention this afternoon. At a very fundamental level, yes. Because I would think about what is the experience of music listening and music making and start with that. I mean, one of the things that's listed in my bio there is a, a friend of mine who teaches at LSU. We, we, we wrote a beginning book for instrumental music called The Habits of Musicianship, aptly named. And the idea is we teach people to play one or two notes on an, on an instrument, and then we have them play melodies that are that comprise one or two notes. But the idea is to play the melodies expressively. Because right? the point of music making, if you're playing an instrument, is to express things to other human beings. And typically what happens is we teach people a lot of notes before we ever start talking about anybody listening to them playing. Right? And of course, it's unnecessary. Because people, you know, with almost every discipline, no one is really a beginner. You know? Especially something like music. I mean, people who go into a beginning music class or beginning music study have been listening to music prenatally. You know, they've been hearing music all of their lives. And then to treat them like, well, let me tell you what music is like. Well, I, actually, they already know what music is like, right? And we do the same kinds of things when we teach physics, right? I mean, we teach kids about friction. They experience friction all the time, right? And, and then we give them a lesson about, with a definition of friction, and never exploiting the idea that they've experienced that and learned to accommodate that every day of their lives. You know, they know that when it's icy, they're going to fall down, you know? And they just don't know all the particulars of it. Um, uh, oh. Yeah, uh, great, uh, great talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, a question. Uh, let's say we were to try to implement this, this approach in, say, a college setting or high school, for that matter. What a mm -hmm. concept. Uh, what about the institutional barriers to doing this? For example, the bell curve, which says that you've got to have a certain amount of stupid people and only a certain number of people can succeed. The fact they use certain courses as cutting courses where it seems like sure. they're trying to get like organic chemistry or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. How do you get around this so we could actually assume that maybe we could have more people adept at a subject, even if they didn't go into that specialty, they would at least have an appreciation, not a hatred for these subjects. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And you know, I, 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 I tell you, I think what most you know, whatever 101 courses, the reason they fail is because they're planned by experts who in the first semester are getting people ready for the second semester and the third semester and the fourth semester, but there won't be those semesters. It's gonna end after the first semester. So the question you ask yourself as a, as a teacher, as a planner, is if this were the only semester that people studied this discipline, even if somebody is a major in the discipline, I'm gonna teach them so at the end of this semester, they are actually competent at some level that I'm able to get them to at the end of this semester. Now, there's an important thing about that for just science literacy in the United States, right? Because the reason the science literacy is so bad in the United States, even people are all, taking all these science classes, is what many of the kids learn is, I hate science, I don't understand science, it doesn't relate to me at all, and they're done, 
right? And the, most of the reason for that is that they don't understand the mathematics related to science, which is daunting to many students, and they're never really experiencing figuring out stuff. I mean, and that being what science is about, is figuring stuff out. They never get to the figuring out part, right? But imagine creating, but you don't have to imagine very hard, creating situations where I'm gonna provide a limited number of experiences that we will do repeatedly, and each one of those repetitions is gonna change the way you think about it. And right now, most of educational experiences are one-off experiences, right? You do it, on to the next thing. And speaking about the idea of individual differences that many of my colleagues on this panel over the past two days have done, right? If you're teaching out of a mathematics book, it's gonna have 36 chapters in it, because there's 36 weeks in a school year. They're organizing unit of six units each, uh, six chapters per unit, because there's six six-week grading periods. And if it's the eighth week of school, we're on chapter two in unit two. And if you don't get something by Friday, well, I'm sorry, because we got to go on to unit, I mean, to chapter three, and we're turning the page. When many of the kids in that room, by Wednesday of the next week, would understand that, right? But we sort of teach in a way that says people should all learn at the same rate, in the same way, at the same time, and if they don't, they just don't have a mind for mathematics or they don't have a mind for science, or they don't have a mind for writing, or whatever it happens to be. It, it's, it's a terrible disservice. Okay, I'll say the stronger word. It's a terrible injustice uh, for children to teach them things that now they could know about and to give them the false impression that they're unable to know about it. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. Um, did you, did you want to? I, I, uh, two, two things. One is a question about frameworks. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter. She's just about finished with high school, uh, going on to college. What worries me is when I grew up, we used to write papers starting from the seventh grade, and what that allowed me to do was to go out, there's chaos out there, mm -hmm. and learn to build frameworks, learn how the pieces fit together, and then to articulate it. And I don't see that happening anymore. Mm -hmm. I see kids completely overloaded. And the other thing is I, I did my graduate training in England for a reason, because I could do multidisciplinary. I didn't have to be, the US tends to be very narrowly discipline focused. Mm -hmm. Talk to about this, uh, this uh, issue about learning how to, to really build frameworks in the mind in order to actually make, begin to make sense of things right. in a multidisciplinary way. And then the second piece, which I think is very important, my wife is German. She looks at me and says, our, tr our academic training for these kids is crazy. They sit around a desk from day one in Germany, and the kids work together. Mm -hmm. And they're very actively working, where we're a very passive system by comparison. Right. So I was just wondering if you have comments on both of those. Sure. Well, e even what Ruth was saying yesterday about medical education now, I mean, there's much more small group collaborative kind of things going on because we realize that's where the money is, you know, is doing that. Um, let, let me just say, say, say something about the, you know, building frameworks. Is, is that that stuff takes time. And right now, the conception in educa public education in the United States is that it's about content. And even in universities, if you look at the course schedule in universities and you look at the names of courses, it's about stuff that's in the courses, right? I mean, Western civilization from 1900 to, you know, that's what the course is about. It's about content. And when, when that's the, what's in the mind of the teacher, then what, what equals more rigor is even more content. Uh, the, 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 the best, worst example of that is advanced pl placement classes in the United States. Advanced placement goes, means really fast. You know, we're going to do all of cell biology this week to show how advanced you are. We're going to go really fast. You know? And everybody remembers a whole bunch of stuff, and they can label the Krebs cycle. What's that do? I have no idea, but I can label all the parts of it, and on to the next thing. Right? And, and, and the idea about that is, again, the dependent measure in the mind of the teacher, the educational system, the parent, is look how much stuff they've covered. You know? And, and to, to, to make an analog for this in music, right? look how hard the repertoire it is these people are playing. You know, which is, which is terrible. But, it, but it's a great metaphor for the same thing. You know, none of us have gone to a concert and paid 50 bucks for a ticket and watched somebody step all over themselves in the first half, you know, and drop a lot of notes and the rhythm's bad and everything, and walk out at intermission and talk to our friends and say, man, that, that guy sure missed a lot of notes, but wow, that music's hard. You know, I can't wait till the second half. No one would say that. You know what I mean? But yet, the very same thing in school, right? The idea that you were saying, look at what these kids are saying. Look how hard this is. Right? And, and hard doesn't mean skillful and deep. S hard means a lot of stuff really fast. And, and that's a, a high hurdle to get over, I think. Thank, thank, thank you, Doctor. Um, this, uh, symp this symposium's on healthcare and its improvement. 
I'm a physician, was trained in South Africa, mm -hmm. been on faculty for 50 years. I just want to congratulate you for showing us today that area of healthcare which needs most radical improvement, namely how students are taught. I, I couldn't agree more. And actually, the past couple, couple of years, I, I've given several talks for med schools and, and associate deans at med, uh, med schools about medical edu education. I, I think the, the medical profession recognizes that something needs to happen. I, I, I think the challenge is how to actually implement some productive change. I just want. I was just, uh, in, in, on your expertise with, with music, I was just wondering if you could just really lightly, because I know we're running out of time, uh -huh. touch on the, the savants. There's been a lot of, you know, some TV programs showing savants and their, their ability just to hear a piece once yep. and just repeat it. For myself, when I play music, there's like, a, there's like a groove you get into. It's almost a transcendent kind of yeah, state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, I could kind of share. I'll just say this br briefly. I mean, there is no activity that engages more of the human brain than music making. Uh, and savants, it's magic. I don't know what to tell you. It's great. Thank you so much. Thanks.